Welcome everyone here to 412 Church in Marietta. Glad you are all here with us. Want to say hello to those of you that are tuning in online. Welcome. We are glad you are here as well. I want to remind everybody that is a disciple of Jesus Christ, meaning two things. He is your Lord. He is your Savior. I want to remind you to win your friends, win your family, and win your neighbors for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, If you are just joining us and you're checking out this whole Christian thing, maybe somebody dragged you out to church or forcing you to watch it online, uh, we hope you enjoy your time with us. I want you to know something very important. God accepts you just as you are, and he sees the potential of who you can be. When I say he accepts you just as you are, my point in telling you that is this. You don't have to fix yourself to come to Jesus. A lot of people think that, well, you know, I'll go to church someday, but right now I'm not ready. I still have to fix this in my life and fix that in my life before I can come to Jesus. That's not how it works. You come to Jesus because he's going to accept you just as you are, but he sees the potential of who you can be. He's never going to leave you the way he found you. He's always going to do a work of change from the inside out. And so we hope you enjoy your time with us today because we're going to share the word of God and the word of God does a whole lot in our lives. You may have seen one of these before and called it a Bible, but for those of us that are disciples of Jesus Christ, we refer to this as the inerrant and the infallible word of the one true living God. Those are two theological words that Pastor Jeremy couldn't tell you last week because he didn't know them, but I know them. So, (laughs) hey, he had to jab me, so I got to jab him back. I'm like, Donald Trump, you hit me, I'm going to hit back. No, I'm just joking, but... (laughs) Those, th- those theological words, all, all they really mean is this. Everything that is in here is true. Everything in here is correct. Everything in here does not change and does not contradict itself. It will always be the same. It is the same yesterday as it is today. God willing, we wake up tomorrow. It will be the same. God says heaven and earth will pass away, but his inerrant, his infallible word will stand forever. I challenge you to prove me wrong in what I just said. That being said, we are going to be in God's Word. We're going to kind of be all around it this morning. The, the title of today's message is, I Say This, about church-state relationships. And I'm going to share briefly out of 1 Timothy chapter 2. So um, you don't have to turn there yet. I'm going to go ahead and read that to you. But let me tell you, today's just a little different than usual. We are in our I Say This Um, monthly time together. And the point of this monthly time together is this. 72% of pastors in America do not believe in what I said a a moment ago, that the Word of God is inerrant and infallible. They don't believe in that. So that's 72% of pastors in America, which leaves only 28% of them that do believe in that. Of the 28% of pastors that do believe in it, only 10% of them, so 2.8% of pastors in America, will take the inerrant, infallible Word of God and take the cultural issues of our day and teach their congregation, this is what God's Word says about this issue, which is a travesty, and here's why. 96% of regular church attenders, defined as people who go to church two or more times per month, 96% of them want their pastor to teach them these things. And yet, it's not happening. Again, a travesty. So what we decided we would do is we take the top 12 things. What are the top 12 cultural issues of our time? And we're going to tackle one per month. So we've been tackling some great issues. We've tackled Islam. We've tackled Israel. Um, we are going through every month and tackling the subject. Today, we're going to talk about, basically, we're going to talk about politics today. It's one of those things where when I was raised up, I was told, don't talk about what? Politics, religion, and sports. Right? This is like, like number one rule in business. You don't talk politics, religion, or sports. Let me tell you, when you don't talk politics and when you don't talk religion, you end up with some funky things going on in your culture. We have to talk about these things. We can't not talk about them as Christians. So um, these topics, if you've missed any of them, you can go to 412marietta.com forward slash sermons and you can catch up. But today we are going to talk about the church's relationship with our government. And I'll tell you, we need to talk about this. We have to. Uh, When the church withdraws from the public square, when we don't tackle these issues, you get things like, I just went up to LA and found out and wanted to make sure what I was about to tell you is correct, and in fact is correct. So there's this doctor 
called Dr. Mengele. It was in the Holocaust. You may remember Auschwitz. You maybe studied it. Um, this doctor performed some freaky, weird stuff, sex changes on children, stuff like that, right? Well, you would think, well, that's Nazi stuff. That doesn't happen today. Well, right now at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, there is a doctor that just got a grant, $5.7 million grant, which means who's paying for that? You're paying for this. You are paying $5.7 million dollars to have this doctor at Children's Hospital Los Angeles inject male hormones into little girls as young as three years old. How do you like that? This is what happens when the church withdraws from the public square. This is what happens when we bind to the lie that we're not allowed to talk about politics, religion, and sports. If you had my way, we wouldn't talk about sports at all. It's a waste of time. We, we need to talk about things that matter eternally. Who cares who wins in the Super Bowl? It doesn't matter. What matters is what is going on in our culture? What does God have to say about it? Everything else is just a distraction. We need to be on point. We need to be on mission. We need to be about what God has called us to be about. And it, this stuff is super, super important. Um, so it matters with the current events, what's going on. We have to talk about the church's relationship with our government. Not only do we have to talk about it with current events, we also have to talk about it in view of prophecy. When we look at prophecy, we know something, and you know I teach this a lot, that the Lord is coming back. And we say that same prayer, even so, come quickly, Lord, when people are injecting male hormones into three-year-old little girls, just disgusting scientific garbage, um, science fiction garbage. Um, the Lord is coming back. And we are told over and over and over again by Jesus. We're told by Paul. It's all over the New Testament to do something very important. And what is it? Watch, right? We're supposed to be watching. Watch, therefore. Why are we told to watch? Well, because we're anticipating his return. And as we anticipate his return, it causes in us this sense of urgency. Urgency for what? Urgency to share our faith with everyone. Why? Because we don't know when he's coming back. I'll submit to you, he's coming back soon. I don't know when. Um, I'm not going to date set, because I want you guys to take me for real. <laughs> um, but here's, here's the fact. He's coming back. All the signs are there. Everything that we've been waiting for, there's, I'll tell you, there is nothing for the rapture of the church. There's nothing else we're waiting for. It could happen at any moment. And so it is imperative that we share with people what's going on. When we say watch, if we're not watching what's going on in politics then what are we watching? What is it that we're supposed to be paying attention to? We're supposed to be paying attention to the political realm. This is stuff that's going on, and it's affecting everybody's lives. Uh, I'm going to give you a very practical point before we invite up our speaker for this morning. And the practical point I want to give you is found in verse 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul exhorts Timothy. Um, he says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior who, listen to this, wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. God wants everyone to be saved. God wants everyone to understand the truth. God wants each of you, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, to be praying for the kings. You're, you're the speaker this morning is going to explain what that means, the kings, and those who are in authority. For you and me, let me just give it to you on a very practical level. You and I should be praying for our school board. You and I should be praying for our city council. You and I should be praying for our senators and our assembly men and women. Do you know who your assembly woman is? If you live in this region, you all better know who it is. Melissa Melendez, thank you. How do you know that? Because she was here. We brought her here. We brought her up. We prayed for her because it's important for us to know who these people are and not only that, but to know how to pray for them. I'll tell you, I've been guilty in the past of this, giving a very general prayer. Okay, I'm supposed to pray for those in government. Lord, I pray for our president. I pray for wisdom. I pray that they would know what to do and make a decision, and yada, 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 yada. And it's a very generic prayer. And 
I'm, I'm confessing that to you because it goes against what I've been teaching you guys. I teach you guys to pray very specifically, don't I? Because when you pray specifically, God answers specifically. So for you and me, it means when we pray for these people, we have to know what specifically we're praying for. When we pray for Melissa Melendez, we know that her son is in Navy dive school right now. That's a very dangerous job. And so she's nervous, and her husband, Nico, he's nervous and hoping that their son does well and, and is safe. We should be praying for her for that, praying for her son. Do you know that your senator, your state senator, is Jeff Stone in this region? Do you know that Jeff Stone is not a believer? He's a conservative, but he doesn't believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Are you praying for his salvation? You should be because of the scripture I just shared with you, that God wants everyone to be saved. God wants everyone to understand the truth. Are we praying for his salvation? Are we praying for his daughter who's pregnant right now? We need to know these things. We need to know how to pray for them very, very specifically. Not just in a general sense. I mean, we should be praying in a general sense, but we should get very specific so we can start to see God answer that prayer in their lives. It's important for us. And so on a very practical level, you getting involved, I mean, obviously we get involved by registering to vote, we vote. I'm giving you guys all sorts of ways to get involved in the community, and that's, for some of you, that's why you keep coming back. Um, but I'm just giving you a very practical thing right now. Pray for these people. They are, and you're going to find out in a moment, they're very real people, and many of them have a very real love for Jesus. And so I want to invite up in just a moment here, Senator Mike Morrell. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Senator Mike Morrell was born and raised right here in California. He was married here, raised his family here. He opened two corporations here, uh, Provident Home Loans and Provident Realty, both incorporated right here in California in 1989. Senator Morrell now represents California's 23rd State Senate District. He served, uh, uh, serves on seven Senate committees including vice chair of the Committee of Housing on the Committee of, uh, on Labor, Public Employment, and Retirement. Senator Morrell regularly receives high marks from the National Freedom of Independent Business, the California Chamber of Commerce, and the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. He's also been named Legislator of the Year by the Military Officers Association of America. Senator Morrell and his wife, Joni, who's here today, um, they've been married for 41 years that deserves a round of applause. That's awesome. 41 years. They have three adult children. Their daughter, Kristen's first priority is her family, and she also teaches on American exceptionalism at Arizona Christian University. Their oldest son, David, works as a legal counsel for the president, and Matthew, their youngest, works for a commercial development company in Arlington, Virginia. Um, one last thing, this is a man who you can tell, and you're going to find out in just a moment, this is a man who spent time soaking in the Word of God. And so it is my pleasure and my privilege right now to invite up California State Senator Mike Morrell. Thank you. Thank you. How are you guys doing? Good. Um, Joni, you want to stand up real quick so they know? If you hear a booing in the back, sometimes it's her. Um, good to be here. Um, great to be out of Sacramento and with normal people. So um, thank you very much. Um, got a lot to cover today, and so I'll do my best to, to do my duty get through as much as we can because I need to talk about politics and religion because they're one of the same. As Pastor said, there's two things you don't talk about, religion and politics, but all of history has proven that the only two ways men oppress other men and either send them into a thousand years of bondage or set them free um, are through those two institutions. So it's the only thing we should talk about, really, um, and baseball. But um, just, yeah, just kidding. <laughs> anyway. Um, um, because it controls our lives. It, it just sort of controls our lives. And it's interesting, I think, that our adversary is the one who told us not to be involved with politics because, uh, you know, there's only 40, 
senators, state senators in California, and they make laws on this terrible sex curriculum. They make laws on how much money you can keep. They make laws that hinder businesses from producing more. Um, they uh, make laws, uh, my friends across the aisle, not a Republican accusation, but they authored and um, passed a bunch of bills lately that's let out over 60,000 uh, convicted felons into our streets. So um, just so many things, you know, that, that um, we've abandoned our civic responsibility, but yet we were to be a country that was self-governing. That means we're supposed to be our own governors. We, the people, give our consent on how those guys in Sacramento and D.C. should be operating. So that's why we've got to be active, vigilant, and brave in the way we exercise our things. Go to the first slide, if you would. Um, what is politics? Aristotle said, um, politics is the ordering of the community to the highest good. And who better to do that than Christians? Wouldn't you agree? But, but think about what we do, obviously, a lot. We advocate our responsibility. And, and we, we're losing a lot these days. And some people do say to me, you know, well, it's end days, whatever. And, and that's true. But, but I think maybe more than that, it's because we don't get in the game and play. You know, we're losing through default. We sit on the sidelines, and uh, you don't win football games if, or baseball games if you don't play, right? And so we have to be, we have to be on that field, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, next slide, sir. Uh, I have um, a 20-minute PowerPoint, a half-hour, 40-minute, an hour PowerPoint. And so on my hour PowerPoint, I have three pages listed of people God used in politics. Joseph always comes to my mind first, and I forgot to put him on the first page. But Moses was in po uh, politics, Daniel, of course. Esther was sent the king, Xerxes, to save the Jewish people. Um, just all the way down, ladies and gentlemen, God uses people in the Old Testament, New Testament um, to engage political leaders. Um, John the Baptist, of course, told people he prayed and repent and baptized them. But he got involved with politics and told the king to stop uh, messing around, and king killed him for that. So anyway, um, God, and he was a great man, according to Christ. He was the greatest man living at the time. Um, next uh, slide. Only 40% or 39% of Christians vote on average. Think about that. There was an article, I think it was a Wall Street Journal, that said if people of faith voted their values in California, we'd win elections. And um, so we're not voting, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, that's like sort of throwing your money away. Um, and your vote does matter, by the way, especially when only 39% of us vote. We need your help um, because the other side, um, I believe, no, I know, based on their bills and that sort of thing, that they have today seem to have embraced the political ideologies of Marx and Lenin over those of Lincoln and Washington. And that means socialism and worse, or depotism uh, with tyranny. And by the way, that's never worked, ever in history. And yet we're going down that path. So very dangerous path. They're after our religious freedom too. Next scripture. It says from Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I'm just going to insert in there, not just, it, it's about biblical knowledge, but I think also things like our Constitution Day, which really, you know, aligns with scriptural principles. My people are being destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I've also rejected you uh, as my priest, because you have ignored the law of God, and I will ignore your children. It's kind of interesting that um, the parents ignore, but the kids are the ones who are going to uh, suffer the consequences, ladies and gentlemen, of us ignoring those things in the Word of God. And one of the reasons I ran for politics was uh, Proverbs says uh, that a duty of a father is to leave an inheritance to his children's children. And I think that goes beyond the financial, uh, but also um, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and because um, socialistic societies, they don't like religion, so they don't let you uh, have religion in there. And so we have a duty, all of us here, to leave to our children and our grandchildren an inheritance, and I believe the greatest thing we can leave them is freedom, and that's freedom of um, things we have, which, by the way, America is the first nation. Why America is great 
the first nation where they were governed by consent. We no longer are ruled by the divine rights of kings. We're the first nation to have religious freedom. Prior to America, there was no religious freedom. If at all, if you had any kind of religion, you adopted the religion of the king. So if you were born in Germany, you would be a um, Lutheran. Uh, Italy, you would have been a Catholic. So you had no choice, freedom of religion, freedom of property rights. Um, the king owned everything then. There were no Century 21 real estate offices back until America came. So, I mean, there's a lot of firsts here, and, and we should be grateful for those things because the founders who wrote those things in our political documents uh, put a lot of thought into them, and they stood on the shoulders of people who possessed a superior wisdom than themselves. They stood on scripture. They stood on the Greeks, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Cicero, Virgil. Uh, they stood on the religious community shoulders of Augustine and, and Thomas Aquinas and then great people like uh, John Locke and, and that sort of thing. So, um, and we are at a, I believe, a very uh, dangerous point in our country um, because we have rejected things. As pastor said, um, 2.9 or whatever it is of these pastors aren't preaching the issues of our day. And the issues of our day today are many, but it's really about immorality or morality. You know, as you look throughout the scriptures, or better yet, if you look, as you look throughout history, immorality will tank a country more than anything. And so go to the next slide, if you will. Uh, George Washington talked about this in his farewell address. The centerpiece of his uh, farewell speech was centered around this right here, that of all the habits uh, and dispositions which lead to um, political prosperity, Morality and religion are indispensable supports. Morality and religion. And see, he got that from history. And um, Moses, by the way, talked about the same thing. 431 years of captivity, the children of Israel were in uh, Egypt, and they groaned. So finally, after all those years, God sets them free, and you know, they get to see all these um, miracles, right? The parting of the Red Sea, the plagues, uh, led by a pillar of fire. But Times start getting a little bit tough. They start complaining. And so God lets them wander in the desert for 40 years because they were, they were complainers. And, um, and yet he says in um, Deuteronomy, you're going to be inheriting, you're going to walk into this promised land, and you're going to be given prosperity as a nation. That doesn't necessarily mean individual prosperity, but as a national uh, as a nation, you're going to be given fresh streams of water, houses, uh, pomegranate trees, olive trees, and vineyards, and cattle, and you're going to have the peace and safety to enjoy it. But he, there is a caveat in there. And in the book of Deuteronomy, there's 34 chapters, and over 50 times, um, God, through Moses, reminds the children of Israel, here's the deal. If you don't follow those moral laws, decrees, and commands, it's going to lead to death. But over 50 times, and God should only have to say something one time, but he's really trying to get something into these people's mind, that you have to be careful, be careful, and be careful to follow those moral laws, decrees, and commands because it's your life, you see? And so today, in our state, my gosh, um, you know, we've got that sex ed bill, which I know you guys have heard about. Um, on the back of the ASB cards, they've got a bill that every kid's going to have an 800 number of Planned Parenthood. So if the girls need an abortion, we've got um, 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 abortion pills that are going to be available at every UC in the state, all by taxpayers' funding. We've got millions of dollars going towards that doctor who was up on the screen earlier. And so these things are, are not good for a country. I also think about um, um, Lincoln during the Civil War. Over 600,000 people were killed during that war, perished, souls were perished, and it's when our country was on, not even one-tenth the size of what America is today in population, and so his second inaugural address, I encourage you to read it, it's very sobering because it's not filled with bright beginnings or hope and change. The American people are asking him, when's this terrible war of destruction of life and property going to end? And he, he just addresses them straightforward. He said, well, look, we're right in a period right now where God's judging us. He says, just as it was said 3,000 years ago, so it is today that the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
Now let me tell you when the war is going to be over, Lincoln says. And this is sobering. He says, when every drop of blood from the lash has been replaced by another's blood pulled from the sword, then we'll be done. Who, is that kind of scary when you think about it? What an honest president, huh? And so here was a thing that I, I asked myself over the years about that. See, Lincoln believed innocent blood shed cries out from the ground for justice. And yet we in America have allowed, Christians have allowed by our silence, over 60 million of these uh, babies to be sent over to the afterlife before they've had a chance at life. And if they're not human beings created in God's image, perhaps we have nothing to worry about. But if they are, and Scripture would sort of lead us to believe that they are human beings created in God's image, and if there has been 60 million of them, and if it's true that we can't do that to innocent human beings, um, you know, we're we're going to be culpable for that. And so we, we need to sober up in these things because um, we don't want God to do that to our nation. So the alternative to that is God's people have to step up and do his work. You know, it's, we have to, in the spirit of the founding, pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor to this, to this high and noble cause, um, not just here but everything, because it's, it's serious stuff. Because, again, this isn't Mike Morrell's opinion, right? I'm, I'm just going by what Washington said. I know what Lincoln said read um, Alexis de Tocqueville, and then Moses and all these other people. So um, we want to be um, mindful of these things, that religion and morality counts, and God's people doing uh, God's work, of course, is, is what we really need to do. I, that's why I don't blame things on those people over there or the liberal or the press. It, you know, we've got enough of good Christians in this country uh, to take our country and our state back. We don't meet, need a majority to prevail, ladies and gentlemen. We just need faithful people. Um, next uh, slide. In the desert, oh, I was gonna say, uh, I kinda meant to say this before I had these slides backwards, but um, so they leave, the Jews leave after 431 years of captivity and they see all these miracles. But times get a little bit tough and they start complaining. And so think about this in government. Listen what the Jews say. In the desert, the whole community grumbled or complained or murmured against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died in the, by the Lord's hand in Egypt, or you could use under big government, socialistic government. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us into this desert to starve this whole assembly to death. Ladies and gentlemen, they saw God's miracles day after day, just like all of us do. Times get a little bit tough, they want to go back and depend upon government. They preferred slavery, even though they complained for 430 years, than they did freedom. And see, the reason why is freedom comes at a cost. It's very tough to do. And right now in America, that's what we have to make a choice on. Are we going to pursue freedom which is difficult, or are we going to pursue government to take care of us? Because there's so many handouts today, ladies and gentlemen. I have people stream in on my office all the time uh, uh, asking for more handouts, more handouts, how government's going to take care of you. And if we do this one program, they say ridiculous stuff. For every $1 the taxpayer uh, spends on this program, this $14 returns in benefits. And, and I always say, well, I'm going to vote for that, but I need to see the empirical data. And then they leave my office and I never see them again. Um, because they don't have that data. They have the making it up disease, I guess. And so, um, and so we're just becoming too dependent. We have over 600 government agencies now, oversight agencies, just in California, that regulates us with people on the payroll. I watch how all our organizations take care of the poor. With California now has 50, well, 50 states in California has 34% of the nation's welfare with more and more people coming out of state here because we have better welfare benefits for these people. And see, they're a voting block for my friends across the aisle. That's why they keep, they keep these programs going. But you know, that's not good for the soul. I think everybody knows that. But also, to show you how bad it can be with government is they're paying the people who administer these programs all kinds of dollars, 200, 300,000 a year in some cases, with lifetime benefits and big fat retirements. But now check this out. 
and here's what I've seen. I'm glad you came back. I thought you left. It was something I said, so thank you. Um, uh, for every dollar they do spend on these government programs, you're lucky with all the administration costs to get 30 to 40 cents on the dollar actually into the hands of the poor. That's terrible management of our tax dollars. But when you take the top 100 charities in America, here's the fact, all 100 of them, get, for every dollar we give them, get 87 cents on a dollar or more into the hands of the people they want to help. Because, you, you know, the uh, Salvation Army, those guys beating that drum, those are usually volunteers who do it for free. So private is much more efficient and effective with our dollars, and that's one of the things. Government really should not be in charge of that. Scripture says over 200 times we have to help the poor. Over 200 times we're commanded to help the poor. Not once does it say government. It's always God's people who are going to help the poor. And I'll tell you what, since I've been in government, the people do it for a lot cheaper and much more efficient and effective than government does it. Government, in many cases, is becoming a scam. Just hire more people, and then they come in my office and they want more money to do crummier work. So, anyway. So we want to be mindful of those things. Um, and here's why I mention this. We are, according to this guy, if any of you guys heard of Hillsdale College, Dr. Larry Arn, uh, good guy, right? Uh, he is in D.C. and works with a lot of people, even the Vice President uh, Pence. And he believes we're entering, he's a political philosopher, America's entering the third great American crisis. And whether we're going to survive is going to be a tough one. It's going to be based on our faith and whether we restore the um, uh, political principles of limited government, which is contained in our Constitution. And so um, the Bible has stuff to say about that. I think I found in 1 Samuel the first evidence where God shows that he doesn't like socialism because in 1 Samuel prior to that, Israel did pretty well. They had something like a republic um, in the fact that God was the executive branch. They had elders who were the legislative guys. Uh, and then they had the judges who was the, ju the judicial branch. Okay, but they wanted a king. Do you guys remember that? They wanted a king. And when I read this, and it was uh, fairly recently, I was amazed about this. And the first person it reminded me of was Maduro in Venezuela because it sounds like he could have easily fit this mold. But go to the next scripture, and I'll read it. So Samuel just is trying to talk the Israelites out of this big government and trusting the king or trusting. We can substitute the name government for king. But Samuel told all the words of the Lord. So these are God's words via through Samuel to the people who were asking for a big government to be ran by a king. I'm going to paraphrase some of this, okay? <laughs> This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. Not your rights, but his. Um, and listen, listen how many things he's going to take. He's going to take your sons and make them serve him with his chariots and horses. Some he will sign to the commands of thousands and others to fifties. And he's going to take others to plow his ground, not your ground, his ground and reap his harvest, not, not your harvest. And still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will then take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. Then he'll take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. Now, think about that. That's exactly what's happening here with big government. As government expands, that's who the attendants are today because then you get hooked on that and then you need money from businesses and you make it tougher on businesses and eventually uh, people don't work for government run out of money. That's what happens when you cross a certain threshold of a percentage of people working for government. And so, um, again, so here's, it keeps going. Then he'll take a tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officials and his attendants. He'll even take your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys, and he'll take it for his own use. He'll take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that's what self-government meant in the Constitution. You have to be your own government, your own governor, and that means you have to know how to provide and take care of your, yourself and your family. 
and that's always better than depending upon government. And I, I, I want to give you an example of most of the Christian colleges in America today. Years ago, they were suspicious when the GI Bill first came out about taking student loans. And they didn't want to do that because back then, they believed government would get their hooks in you. Well, little by little, all these Christian colleges as well as secular colleges have been taking government money because they can't raise enough money or get enough tuition, so they get help from the government. Well, some held off, right? Uh, but as this began, Title IX and Title IV had 20 pages, then it was 200 pages, then it was 300, 400, I think it's between four and 500 pages of do's and don'ts. So if these colleges take government funds, what it does is it weakens their mission statements of what they really want to accomplish. And sadly, so many of these colleges, there's only two that I know of in America, accredited colleges, that do not take government funds. They've chose to hand their, have their hand up to God rather than out to government. And as I've seen this, I've had opportunity to work with 22 Christian colleges on a bill a couple years ago in America, and I've talked to these college presidents, and I believe the majority of them are loosening and sort of backing away. They're more afraid of government than they are for God, and they'd rather have the money for government than, than trusting in God. That's a terrible thing to say, but if you read in the newspaper about Azusa Pacific, do you guys know what's going on there? Well, they trusted government a little bit too much. They weakened their uh, mission statement, and now the college has a tremendous amount of problems, and you're going to see other colleges go that way. And the whole thing sort of relates back to Samuel. They chose to trust in the king or government, and that's a challenge. You know, um, on the websites of these colleges, many of them say, we're going to teach your kids how to do this, that, and we're going to teach them how to have a big heart and compassion and a lot of faith. But yet they have their hand out to government. And so um, government, when you do that, they want something from you. Don't think you're going to get off scot-free. And so one of those colleges that I just want to say is Hillsdale College. And it's neat to see how God's blessed them and how much money they raise. They raise at least 10 times much than most of the other colleges out there because they put their priorities in the right person. So anyway... Uh, the next thing I'd like to share is moving into sort of the Declaration of Independence. Um, have you ever heard they say the Constitution is a living document? You know what that means. That means it can change, right? It changes with the time. Um, it doesn't change with the time. But the Constitution rests upon the Declaration of Independence. So um, I'm going to run out of time here soon, so I'm not going to be able to get through the whole presentation. But this is one thing I want to nail down because it's the whole basis uh, of our Constitution. It's the whole basis of law in America. And um, so I'll tell you a story, and then um, you'll, hopefully I can you'll gain what I'm trying to get to. Um, Clarence Thomas, remember, he was going for the Supreme Court um, 22, 25 years ago. Um, he was up there, and then Senator Joseph Biden asked him, what's your basis of law? If you're going to make a decision, what's your basis? Clarence Thomas said, well, according to the natural law, which was taught in all law schools at the time, it's a thing our Constitution rests on. Joseph Biden said, I'm not sure what you mean. So Clarence Thomas said, well, well according to the laws of nature, and of nature is God. And Biden said, where did you get that from? Remember, this guy was our vice president. Turn to the next slide. Notice there, a, a few lines down, I'll go to the third line. It's in the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, and I, I could just picture, I don't know what Clarence Thomas was thinking, but he's got 60 million people watching that show. You've got, he's trying to be confirmed to the Supreme Court, and he doesn't want to embarrass Biden, but he's got to tell him somehow it's in the first paragraph, Declaration of Independence, the most important phrase of our constitutional documents. Do you see it there? It says, that, and to assume that among the powers of the earth and separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Um, that means we can discover truth through two, two ways, human reason or through scripture, divine revelation. And they never contradict each other. So that means you could look at history, because it will repeat itself. You can look, look at human nature, 
because human nature, there's things there and there's human beings that we do. If you ever read C.S. Lewis' book, um, Mere Christianity, the first three chapters is that's what he deals with. He says there is some kind of truth out there. You know, he said, um, take a man who's a moral relativist, right? He doesn't believe in truth. He says, simply steal that man's wallet and suddenly he'll become very moral and say what you did is wrong, you see? And he gives all these examples. It's, it's really silly, right? And of course, the Bible teaches us not to steal. But anyway, look at a few lines down to the next paragraph. We hold these, what to be self-evident. That's what the laws of nature and nature's God means, is there's self-evident truth, ladies and gentlemen, that never change. That's why the Dems call themselves progressives, because it's a great word. It sounds like, hey, we're cool, we're moving forward. That's good for technology, but on principles of life, whether the Ten Commandments or whatever, principles never change. And that's why we have to stick by those things. And that's why our Constitution rests upon the Declaration of Independence, that there's certain self-evident truths that will never change. Morally, they never change. Economically, they never change. And politically, they never change. And so if one thing I can leave you today um, is to try to learn a little bit about this. And I've had interns. I've ha hired over... 400 interns since I've been in politics. The average senator hires three to five. I don't know why I got so many over the years, but I just have. And I work them hard, of course. That was one of the benefits. But we train them in these things. And we train them on a lot of things. Um, we introduce them to the writings by Plutarch, uh, Ethics by Aristotle. Plutarch, which, which I found out, if you get a chance, he was a biographer, so he would write about the lives of famous peoples like Marcus Aurelius, who was, which is a great general, or Alexander the Great, uh, great general, but not always a nice guy when he kills his best friend. But anyway, they, they all had minor flaws, right? Um, but anyway, uh, we introduced him to these different people, and I'm, I'm so enthusiastic about these young kids. Some of them are liberal, some conservative, and most of them are political science majors. And you know the thing that they like the most is learning about the laws of nature and nature's God. And, it blew, and they want to know if there is self-evident truth. So it gives me hope for that generation. Because they also tell me they've not learned these things in their colleges that are teaching political science. And yet the whole basis of law and the Constitution starts right here. And so they don't know that stuff. They love that stuff. It gives me hope for the next generation. But we need to learn that stuff because there is truth. And in fact, uh, if you don't believe me, go to the next one. Um, chapter 2 of Romans, God says he's written the moral law, the moral law on every man and woman's heart and mind. Chapter 1 even says we're, we're, we have no excuses about God or the knowledge of God, even in God's invisible attributes because it's all been written on our hearts and minds. And so we've already won all these arguments. The things that the pastor showed up on the board, all that money, we all know that's wrong. The other side knows it's wrong. We need to hold our heads up high and make sure that when we speak, we speak directly the truth because they already know, ladies and gentlemen. That's why there's the politically correct speech. That's been all throughout history. It's just been called different things. And when you get to that, it means they, have, they do not have the ability to defend or debate their issues. So what they have to do is accuse you and name call. Accuse and blame, blame and accuse. And I think that comes back from the very beginning at the garden, don't you? So anyway, next slide, sir. I kind of went over this. Uh, as I said, I, I got involved in politics based on uh, Proverbs, that a father's responsibility is leave to his kids an inheritance, not just financially, um, but of freedom. And so I'm working hard to do that. Some days I take one step forward in California, it seems like I get pushed back 10 steps, but um, being Christians, we're never supposed to give up. Um, and I don't believe I ever will. I hope not. Um, got good people praying for us. But I love the way the Declaration of Independence um, uh, signs off, because we have a duty to future generations. And it signs off with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Sacred honor means we give the deepest part of our soul to our country and our fellow country, men and women, as well as our families. And part of that's our fortune. So here's what I'm trying to say. We got to give it all. Ladies and gentlemen, we're at a time in history 
where, where we, we've got to give it all or we're going to end up with nothing anyhow. And I was listening to this one book on tape over Christmas time on uh, Marcus Aurelius, and he had these things. Christianity had just come, but not to his part of the world. So he would write this, these things when uh, it was called his meditations when he was in the battlefield. And they were pretty cool. He had a lot of uh, things in there, like the virtues. It almost sounded like he got them from the Bible. But there was one in particular that he talked about good leadership. And I have read a lot of books on leadership, being in business, but they neglected to write this thing in there. He said, good and true leadership requires this. You've got to be willing to lose it all. You, gotta, you really have a cause. You've got to be ready to pledge your lives, your fortune, the sacred honor. This is no game. That's, he believed that. Churchill believed it. And Lincoln went broke a couple of times, as did Churchill. Those men risked everything. It was funny. Right after I uh, <laughs> was listening to those books on tape that week, Joan and I were in Arizona, and we went and visited a church. The pastor, you know, it's the Sunday before Christmas. pastor gives a sermon that Christ came to die to give everything. Therefore, we have to give everything. What is it that you're unwilling to give up? because you need to get rid of that thing. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we've been put here for a purpose on, on life, uh, or in life. And let me tell you something. California, it said, as California goes, so goes the nation. Have you guys ever heard that one? They say what happens in California happens in another state in five or ten years. A lot of people are leaving here. They're not going to escape the wrath of California, ladies and gentlemen, because this is the battleground of America. This is the battleground for the soul right here. And that's why we, we have to do everything we can, pray everything we can do because um, our lives, our fortunes, and our honor all depend on it for us and for the sake of other generations. So um, it's not a game any longer. There's not going to be a uh, pull a rabbit out of the hat. We have to get busy um, about the Lord's work and the things that um, are going to be required to save our country. Serious stuff. Um, next one, let's skip over that one because I've gone over. Uh, okay, limited government. Look at, real quick, like, um, the Constitution only has 18 enumerated powers. That means that's all Congress can do. Half of those are for our military, and the majority of the other half are providing infrastructure for business. That means good roads so commerce can flow. Anything outside of that should not be in a constitution. Yet today, there's thousands of things that people think they have rights to. Natural rights and then just people's desires for things are completely different. Natural rights are real limited. Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. By the way, happiness didn't mean having a motorhome. Happiness came from the word, uh, from the Beatitudes, Christ's Sermon on the Mount. What that is, happiness means to be blessed while you're here on earth, and it means virtue. And the highest virtue the founders were trying to obtain that we would be left alone from the king where we can, because the highest virtue was be, being able to be left alone from a king where according to the dictates of our own conscience, we could pursue our highest duty to God. And they believe when you're free to pursue your highest duty to God, that's what brings people happiness, ladies and gentlemen. That's what our Constitution Declaration was all about. Um, Go over, uh, skip a few, and I'll tell you when to stop. One more, one more, right there. Uh, I'm going to start summing this up here. So this is our call, right, that we've been instructed to expose darkness. Darkness hates the light, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you something. Here's what I've learned. I believe, just like John the Baptist, you can pray, you can preach, you can invite people to church. I don't think they're going to bug you too much or hang you. But as soon as you take a stand against something that's immoral, they're going to come after you. That's what happened to John the Baptist. He had a pretty good ministry until he told King Herod to stop sleeping with your brother's wife, and then he was executed. These folks do not like when we go against immorality to, uh, because our God wants that. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to get where the fire is the hottest, get involved with political issues, and uh, you'll find out who your enemies are real quick when you expose darkness. Demolish strongholds. That's our duty is to demolish these strongholds and their arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against knowledge of God. And of course, always defend the defenseless. Last, last one. Um, I like this, this guy, Winston Churchill, because we think there's no hope. There's always hope. Think about California. 
20, only state with 21 missions. Focus on the family, world vision, and all kinds of other great Christian organizations were founded here. We have the more mega churches than any other state in America. Um, Billy Graham, right up here in the mountains at Forest Home when he was a young man, there's a plaque up there, you can go and see it. He believed God had called him at that place to preach the gospel to the entire world. And so we have a wonderful Christian heritage. I, I could go on for an hour how many things have happened in California more than any other state. And, and I think many people have forgotten this rich heritage we have, but I don't believe God's forgotten it, and I believe he wants a state back, ladies and gentlemen. And, and we, his people, need to be the ones to do that. And if you think you don't have any hope, consider Winston Churchill, who, when he wrote this, London was being bombed by Hitler and the Nazis 57 consecutive nights in a row. That would be like D.C. being lit up with fire for 57 consecutive nights. We would lose all hope. But this guy didn't. This is why he was a winner, and uh, he did the best he could with some pretty tough circumstances, but this is going to be our call, and I'll end with this, our charge as we go out there, and let's try to remember these words this week. So during those tough times, Churchill says, never give in, never, 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 and nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense, never yield to force, and never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. And all God's children said... Thank you guys very much for your time. By a show of hands, how many of you have a different opinion of at least some of the politicians having been here this morning? How many of you view it differently? I'm glad to see that. Um, you know, one of the things that you said, Senator, was uh, that you have to be willing to lose it all. And I just want to remind you guys, that's not a new concept. Jesus himself, he said, if anybody desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever, whosoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And that's Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. And I'll tell you, you have to be willing to just lose it all for Jesus. In fact, he said to do it how many, how many times a year? 365 times a year, every single day. We have to be willing to lose it all for Jesus. Uh, I, hope that, uh, I hope that you see I'm trying to lead by example in that area. Um, with this wicked sex ed curriculum, there is a lot of misinformation out there. And we've got, coming up on the 14th, is the Sex Ed Parent Information Night. I hope you all will join us for that. Um, this coming week, I'm going to be back up in Sacramento, and I'm going to be speaking about the spiritual abuse portion of the California framework. Um, yes, spiritual abuse. So you guys have more to hear from me on that. But I'm going to be up there and trying to help lead the way at a rally there May 8th, and I wanted to... Ask pa I'm a pastor, you spoke like a pastor, um, Senator Mike Morrell, to share with us, there is a bill, uh, SB 673, coming up, and this is a bill you all need to know about. Uh, would you explain why they need to know about this? Well, the sex curriculum, I, I don't know if you know about that, but I'm not a prude, but I'm not a pervert either, and some <laughs> of this stuff is just bad when they, um, I even don't want to share, but they... Uh, uh, explain the kids, show them pictures on self-pleasure and, and different items they can get around their house. And, and so it's, that, that, I'll just leave it at that. And wherever your imagination takes you, just double it and it's worse than that. Um, and so I have a bill 673 to try to counter that and slow it up. I know they're not going to stop this bill. And so what I'm trying to do, and this is amazing, all I want to do is get the school districts to put that sex curriculum on their websites, all of it. They don't want to do it. They don't want to give full disclosure, and they're always saying the word transparency up in Sacramento, it makes me sick, but yet they don't want to do this. You know why? Because they're hiding something, right? And so that's what I'm trying to do, because it should be a parental right, what should be taught. 
right? So I'm not arguing with them about the sex curriculum. I'm going to let him do that. I'm arguing it's parental rights. And so what they've done, that's my first thing. Second thing is there is an opt-out clause, but it's very deceptive. So listen carefully. So what happens is your kid looks at all that stuff, goes through the training. The parents, if they find out about it, get upset. Well, then the school says, oh, they can opt out then. So what I want to do is an opt-in. And the way the opt-in works is first the parents have to look at the curriculum, and then they decide by signing, oh, sure, let my kid opt-in. Most parents aren't going to do that, ladies and gentlemen. And so we need your prayer and your help. And I got a petition I'm going to send to you if you'll sign it because um, we got to gin this thing up between now and January because I still believe in the people of California. When they really see what's going on with this curriculum, how bad it really is, I think they're going to side with us. So mine's an opt-in, not an opt-out because it, 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 it stops right in the beginning. And then all we're looking for is full disclosure and transparency that that stuff should be available online to parents over 21 years old before we show it to our kindergartens. Pretty simple, so thank you. Thank you. So signing your petition, uh, showing up on May 14th to find out more about the sex ed curriculum, uh, we're going to have medical professionals, legal professionals, educational professionals, and scriptural professionals at this event. And the whole idea is we want you to be informed because we want you to be able to make good decisions for your family. So that's one thing. Show up for this. Sign the petition. Is there anything else from your end, Senator, that they can do? What, what are some actions that they can take besides signing your petition? Yeah, um, you know, there's a couple of things. How I got involved with politics, um, I just started reading things that were easy to read with a lot of pictures, right? And then um, I started... Um, you know, moving up a little bit and even reading more and learning more. And um, then I realized how important government is to our lives, that it can, it can tank us or it can whatever. So if you're not involved, I would just, Hillsdale College has a great website. They've got a podcast of all the history that they go through the great books 30 minutes at a time. Or if you want to look at their videos for an hour, but it's great training, great resources, and and I think if you just start getting this stuff in your life, and then just start speaking it, because we can no longer be silent, ladies and gentlemen. Silence is a sin, by the way, if we're not uh, defending truth. And so those are the two things: is 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 uh, get up to speed, be reading. I hear um, some of these bad guys like George Soros reads 50 books a year, you know. And so we've got to be reading, we've got to be learning. Uh, Proverbs says 19 times as we want to acquire knowledge because uh, one time it says it puffs up, but the other 18 times it says that uh, it will preserve your life and, and do all sorts of things. And so we want to, we want to gain that knowledge and then we want to, we want to speak it out into the world um, so we understand the arguments. And then, of course, pray like the Dickens. All right, speaking of prayer... Um, we want to pray specifically for Senator Mike Morrell. What are some things that we can be doing to pray for you? Well, um, I'd like prayer for um, my family as I express um, Sacramento's hard. So pray for strength and courage in that. But, but that, God's been good to me on that. But when one of our family members are tanking, I fall apart on everything else in my life. So that, just pray that our family would remain strong and healthy because you need energy to do this job. You need to be able to sleep nights, get up, and so you don't have a foggy mind. And um, those would be the two main prayers that I have for right now. Thank you. All right. Well, if you guys would uh, join me in prayer right now, if you would extend your hands out as a sign of blessing and agreement, and let's pray for Senator Mike Morrell. Father in heaven, we come before you with grateful hearts to know you and to be able to call upon you as our God, to know that you are everywhere at every given time. You have all strength, Lord. You have all wisdom. We're praying that your strength, your wisdom would be added to Senator Mike Morrell, Lord, that he would be strong and wise to accomplish all you want him to accomplish. Lord, um, I pray that you would protect his family Lord, I, I know this just as well as he does, that when you're on a mission for you, 
the enemy wants to attack our family in an effort to distract us and to slow us down. So I pray for protection on his family, Lord. Would you bless his wife, Joni? Would you bless his children? Would you bless his entire family, Lord, with protection, with provision, with a clarity of vision for their future? Lord, would you do, uh, continue to do amazing things in and through their lives? Lord, would they continue to be those people that share your light with everyone they come in contact with? Being up there in Sacramento, Lord, being around people that, that are majority against you, uh, would you strengthen him as he continues to stand for you? As he's shown, Lord, that the abundance of his heart, his mouth just speaks out your word, your truth, the, the true the trueness that's found in your word, Lord. Bless him. We pray together collectively as children of God adopted into your family. We're praying for our brother in Christ, Senator Mike Morrell. Lord, we pray these things in the beautiful, the holy, the powerful, the majestic name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, I hope that message you just heard was a blessing to you. It was a challenge to you. It was encouragement to you. Most of all, I hope that if you are a person who has not given your life to Jesus, that this message just encouraged you to do just that. It's very simple to do. All you have to do is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you can say this prayer with me right now. Father in heaven, I confess to you today that I am a sinner uh, Lord, that I have messed up in life. I haven't lived up to your very high standard, nor can I. And so I'm grateful for what I understand today. I understand that you sent your son, Jesus, to walk here on this earth, to live a life of perfection, to die a death on a cross, to go into the grave, but not just to stay there. He came out, he rose again, and I believe that today. I believe he sent his Holy Spirit. Lord, that as I believe in you today, your Holy Spirit will come upon me that you will take up residence within me, that you will give me the strength, you will give me the wisdom, you will give me the courage, you will give me the boldness, the faith, everything I need to live for you. And so I promise this day forward that my life will be a life spent trying to please you. I pray, Lord, that as I mess up, and I know I will, I pray that your grace and your mercy would be upon me and that you would give me the encouragement to move forward. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, if you just said that prayer, first of all, I want to welcome you to the family of God. I want you to know that angels in heaven are rejoicing, and we here at 412 Marietta want to rejoice with you. And the next thing you got to know is there's a step that goes beyond giving your life over to Jesus, that is the step called discipleship. And what this is, is the process that you begin to grow in this newfound faith of yours. And we don't want to leave you alone to do that by yourself. God has given his Holy Spirit to you to help you in that, and he brings other people around you. And so we here at 412 Marietta want to help you in that process. So come on out to the church. We'd love to give you the encouragement, give you the tools that you need in this newfound faith. And uh, we'd love to help you grow in your walk. And so come on out on Sundays, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And if you do, come on out and say hello to me. I'd love to get to meet you and encourage you in your faith. God bless you. I love you.